So yeah, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we do, which will give you a sense of our challenge. Um, so we're res we're the we're responsible for. Um, so we're not. Yeah, we the World Glacier Mining Service is a little bit interesting as a data repository in that we actually maintain a single, very important, long running data set that we curate from submissions that we receive from all of our national correspondents around the world and, uh, and other um, scientists who are, who are themselves going out to glaciers, making measurements um, often in the old, in old school ways. Um, so these are really important on the ground measurements of glacier mass change. So basically like you stick a rod um, into the glacier and you go back regularly and you measure um, at that location by measuring the amount of the stick that's sticking out of the ice, how much ice has melted or maybe how much snow has uh, fallen. Um, you know, and you basically look at the, the surface change. Um, and these are measurements that are very important for calibrating a much larger scale measurements that we do from space with satellites, um, which are obviously you can get global coverage, which is what this math is showing. Um, but there's bigger uncertainties um, and you're not measuring the same thing. So when you, yeah, you go in, in person and you measure, um, you measure the mass change, like you can actually estimate, you know, how much was ice, how much was snow, what was the density. Um, so you're really like estimating the amount of water removed from the glacier, uh, which you can't really do so much from, from this um, satellite measurements. Anyway, um, and so we have, um, these are observations that are coming in from many, many places. Um, and they result in these time series of glacier uh, lens change, glacier mass balance, that's what I was describing, um, and also glacier thickness change measured from space. Um, and I, I took on, so the biggest, the, by far the biggest challenge that we have, I think, is um, that we have people you know, data, the data is not generated by machines because these are not really automated instruments. These are, think of hundreds of different people who are writing up their numbers and sending them to us every year. Um, and so a lot of my work has been coming up with a, um, a way to uh, manage that <laughs> and to catch errors um, and to make it easier for our contributors, but also make it easier for us to review their submissions. Um, and so that's, um, I, so I adopted the frictionless uh, tabular data package approach um, and generally been trying to get as much of the logic of the organization and the data management into centralized metadata. Um, and so that's, for example, um, yeah, if you have the uh, data package descriptor um, and maybe some documentation templates, something like uh, maybe Jinja you've, you're familiar with, um, you can generate automatically, say, a spreadsheet template that would help someone uh, do data entry. Um, and so we have, you know, we have a data package that describes the submission format. We have another one, of course, for the sort of output format. Um, and then software that takes care of all the logic of keeping these pieces together. Um, but the idea is that as much of our data workflow is stems from this sort of central metadata, um, generates instructions for submitters, generates documentation for data users, all from the same place. Um, now I've, when it comes to actually validating submissions, um, validating our data, I've in this case gone a bit um, further, kind of my own way a little bit in terms of validation. Um, and that's another project that maybe at some point I'll talk about um, um, a bit of a different approach for data validation um, where it scales to much longer pipelines. So just to give you a, an idea here, um, we're running the data submissions through, I think it's at this point over 700 checks. Um, you know, these are just a lot of cross tabular uh, validation, a lot of cross uh, sort of 
across rows, um, a lot of logical inference. Well, like if this is null, then really that shouldn't be null unless it's other, you know, like things like that. Um, and so I found that quite difficult in the end to pull off and to have it be fast um, with Bricklinish. So this is where I'm kind of doing a little bit of my own thing. And the spreadsheets sort of play a central role, whether I like Excel or not, um, because so many people who um, send data to us, or that's what they're comfortable using. Like that's so Excel is is king um, in many worlds, and um, and also some of the people in the World Glacial Mining Service. That's what they're most comfortable using. And so I also, besides the templates, actually have this whole system where, um, based on the validation pipeline. Um, there's an Excel file that gets generated with sort of built-in markup that then a human a reviewer can um, can modify kind of in situ and then it gets reloaded and rerun through the pipeline and they basically iterate um, and it's frankly a pretty uh, there's some care one has to make <laughs> when dealing passing the data through a spreadsheet especially Excel but um, in the end, it's a pretty efficient way to work um, for folks who are not, and we don't have to invent a whole um, new interface. Um, so um, just actually today, um, <laughs> I started to pull out this functionality for the template generation um, into its own package, which I just posted to GitHub and I named it Tablecloth, um, which is cute. Um, and you can tell me what you think. Um, but it's basically structured now so that there's there's you know a general um, class which is just keeping track of like, well, where is a table in your spreadsheet? You know, and what sheet is it? Um, um, if you have for a drop down, maybe you have a list of values <clears throat> in the sheet somewhere. You know, you basically register the tabular layout in the spreadsheet, and then you can um, have it generate, kind of tell you where things are in spreadsheet notation, um, and also formulas for different types of validation. So this is kind of the core. Um, and then basically, then you can, there's a version for Excel. I'm gonna have to write, rewrite the one for the Google Sheets support. Um, and here is where I'm a bit of a loss is there's so many different possible ways of doing this that it's hard to come up with all the possible um, arguments <laughs> to a function to control the behavior. Um, but in short, and I'll switch to actually showing what this looks like. Um, this is where the support for different features that you're, you'd be familiar with from the frictionless specs are. So Excel and Google Sheets, although I have to rewrite that into the tablecloth uh, version. Um, I've made only so far through um, integer number string and Boolean fields, um, but also, but all constraints um, and at least regular expressions, at least in Google Sheets, um, Excel doesn't support it. And then also foreign keys, at least one-to-one -one foreign keys. Um, there's just a limit to what you can um, do in spreadsheets um, and not get in the weeds. Um, so maybe I should now show you, since we promised a demo, uh, what this looks like. Can you still see that my screen? Yes. Um, so here's, here's uh, imagine two tables. So main and secondary down here. And there is hidden from view, there is an, a third sheet that has um, for drop downs. Um, and ID is required. So, so we have the columns and some simple, it could be more complicated, but little. So that's uh, pulled from, in this case, is the field description being used as comments. But that's, modified. And now um, ID is required actually. And so if as soon as there's a value in the row, um, it'll tell you that in fact it's invalid um, in red until you 
fill it with a value. Now it also has to be unique. So now that you have duplicate values, those are also highlighted. Boolean, that gets a little drop down. Um, yeah, then there's string min and max. I forget what the actual requirements are, um, but you get the idea. Uh, oh, and the enum. So ooh, A, B, or C, excellent. So if we do C, the D would be, oh, it wouldn't even let us do it. Um, and here, this is the dropdown from main. So ID, so it's a foreign key. And so it, it requires uh, values that are currently here. So if we added a two, and we could add a two, but three wouldn't be allowed. And if I add, if I delete the two, <laughs> then this is red. Um, now there's different levels of um, protection um, and, or an, it could be more annoying and actually uh, have it yell at you immediately. And, and here is actually listing all of the requirements, integer, not blank, unique, greater or equal to one. Um, so that's another option of you know, turning on these um, alerts or not. Um, and it gets more complicated and maybe you start to understand why this is useful. Um, wait, <laughs> sorry, here we go. So here's actually one from a many, many different tables format. Um, where now this is um, sort of a chain of, of uh, tables that are related to each other, um, where, so here, let's say 2020, and those, those are still showing is not found until they're here. And of course, this is actually still not found because it expects to be here. And anyway, we go back and now they're showing as valid. So that's just how it looks. In the end, it's just a spreadsheet, but with a lot of formulas built in. Um, yeah. And I guess I can put up, here's my contact info and the link to tablecloth and also um, other code from the WGMS, the World Vision Mining Service is um, on the GitLab page.